Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing select quote stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Select quote uses its database to find people the best life insurance, auto, home, Medicare Advantage, Medicare Supplement, and many more types of insurance. The company earns revenue from each successful referral. They do not assume any underwriting risk as a typical insurance company does. I recently did a video on Go Health, ticker GOCO, which does the same exact thing as this company. You should think of Go Health and Select Quote as tech companies, not insurance companies. Their product uses artificial intelligence and specialized algorithms to find the best insurance plan for each individual that contacts them. The insurance provider assumes all the insurance risk, not the insurance broker. There are so many options to buy insurance, it can be confusing to almost anyone, which is why the insurance broker industry is a highly needed part of the process. Even if you are comfortable with searching online and doing the math, you still never know if you're getting the best deal or not, since you cannot search through the sea of companies and the various plans each company offers. The insurance broker wants the most cost-effective plan for you, since they want you to stay on that plan for a long time. The longer you stay on the plan, the better for that broker's reputation and their revenue. If you contact an individual insurance company, they just want you to get a plan with them, not the best plan, which could be with another insurance company. The company is headquartered in Overland Park, Kansas and was founded in 1985. It started trading in 2020 and can be found on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, and Börse Stuttgart. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 2.3 billion market cap. They're trading at $14 a share, and they have 164 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video, and free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they do have negative free cash flow each year. We'll talk more about this later. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that looks really good, growing from 35 million up to 131 million. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that looks amazing. 234 million, way up to 938 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. A bulk of their revenue is from senior insurance, 728 million. Then life insurance, 185 million. Then auto and home, 31 million. I think corporate and eliminations is the adjustments for these three buckets. Not only do they have the most revenue in senior insurance, they have the best EBITDA margins. They convert 33% of their revenue into EBITDA. Life insurance is only 16%. Auto and home is 26%. Of their 938 million of revenue, 827 million was from commission, 111 million was from production bonuses. This is based on attaining predetermined revenue goals or other benchmarks agreed upon between this company and the insurance carrier. Like for example, if a particular insurance carrier said, if you bring in X number of clients this month, I'll give you a $50,000 bonus. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that grew a lot from 150 million to 667 million. Below that is operating expenses, and the 467 million of operating expenses, this is 385 million of marketing, 63 million of payroll, and it looks like 18.6 million to maintain their website. So they do have positive operating income each year and it's growing. It grew five times from 2018 to 2021. They've been taking on some debt. So they had 29 million of interest on their debt and they do have positive net income every year. So that looks really good. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they had a small positive in 2019, but the other years they had negative operating cash flow. That seems odd that a company with positive net income has negative operating cash flow. Here is a breakdown of their operating cash flow from their 10K. The main reason they have negative operating cash flow is this big negative in commissions receivables. In 2021, they booked $826 million of commissions, but they didn't receive the cash for $333 million of that. They'll receive it in the future. So they have to book a receivable on the balance sheet. Since they reported all the revenue on the income statement, but didn't receive all the cash, that's why they have a negative in the statement of cash flows. Here's a definition of commissions receivables in their 10K. So it appears if the insurer renews their contract after one year, 
then the company will get these commissions. So as years go on, there'll be a backlog of commissions. So at some point, cash flow should start rolling in when a lot of these people renew their contracts. There is a chance a lot of these people do not renew their contracts. That means the company has to pass through an impairment loss. That means they have to reduce the value of the receivable on their balance sheet and then pass through a loss onto the income statement. But they never got the cash to begin with, so that loss is a non-cash item. The company has not passed through any impairment losses in 2020 and 2021. They spend between $6 million and $23 million a year on CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow, which is negative each year. The way they're funding their business from capital stock and debt. When they IPO, they generated $475 million of cash. They added $290 million of debt in 2020 and $140 million in 2021. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have $675 million of equity. They raised $545 million from issuing stock, and they profited $128 million from running their business. Retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes. They did profit $128 million, but their cash flow negative because they booked so much in receivables. Let's look at the capital structure. $675 million of equity, $500 million of debt. They have 57% equity, 43% debt. Their net debt is $219 million. Their weighted average cost of capital is 8.11%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $3.6 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.7 billion. We divide that by 164 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $17. They're trading at $14, so they're trading at a 17% discount. It's a buy according to the model. According to Simply Wall Street, the average analyst projects their revenue to grow 20.2%. I grew their revenue 20.2% the next four years. And the way I calculated their future free cash flows, I assumed they'd still have negative free cash flow from booking all those receivables. And then in 2024, they should start receiving a lot more cash flow than they're booking. The average company converts 10% of their revenue to free cash flow. So that's how I got the free cash flow number for 2024 and 2025. Simply, Wall Street values the stock at $21 a share. They're saying it's 34% undervalued. Seven analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $18. This is where the stock has been trading since it IPO'd. So it looks like it IPO'd around $26, $27. And then it dropped a bit the first few weeks. They've had a bunch of problems after this point and the stock really came down below $10 a share. This is the price chart the last 12 months, so you can see the stock has struggled a lot. The stock dropped a lot during the second quarter earnings. It also dropped a ton during third quarter earnings. This big candlestick right here, this big drop, that's when the company got slapped with a class action lawsuit. Investors felt the company's positive statements about their business operations and prospects were misleading. Their second quarter and third quarter earnings fell way below analyst estimates. If you look at a company like Microsoft or Apple, at any given time, they're dealing with dozens of lawsuits. This is not a new thing. This happens quite often. It's a very litigious country we're in. A lawsuit can be a great buying opportunity. A lot of people picked up the stock when it was below $10, and they drove it way back up to $14. It's still trading way below where it was a few months back. If you really feel the company doesn't have a bright future and is all smoke and mirrors, then just don't buy the stock. But they're like any company, trying to be really positive, and I think they were a little too positive. The numbers they're reporting are accurate. It's not like they're reporting fake numbers. They're reporting the correct numbers. It's just that they talk really highly about the firm and it was construed as misleading. You can see this big gap right here. That was in the first quarter earnings report. It closed at this point and then it opened way down here. And the gap hasn't gotten filled yet. It came way down. 10% of gaps never get filled. This could be one of the 10%. Medicare Advantage enrollment has been going up a ton the past 10, 15 years. It was as low as 5.3 million people, and that consisted of only 13% of the people who received Medicare. Now it's up to 39% of the people who receive Medicare, and it's 24.1 million are Medicare Advantage. And this is mainly what this company does. It sells Medicare Advantage plans. The government pays seniors for Medicare, and the way it's funded, it's funded through Social Security and also your taxes. Everybody pays Medicare taxes. But insurance companies have come out with this new thing called Medicare Advantage. And this is an all-in-one alternative to Medicare. It bundles Part A, Part B, and Part D. And it's benefited a lot of seniors because they have lower out-of-pocket costs. Economically, it makes sense for some seniors to get this insurance since the cost of the insurance is lower than the expenses it saves. 
And this insurance provides other things as well, vision, hearing, dental, and much more. The stock has struggled the past 52 weeks, down 41%. The S&P is up 32%. The stock got down to $8 a share. Its high was 33 and it's trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. In the past 10 days, 5 million shares have been traded on this stock. Of the 164 million shares outstanding, 119 million are on float. 68% are held by institutions, and over 4% of the shares on float are shorted. The company's short percentage peaked in March at 9.2%. That's when the stock was at its highest. It was also pretty high in April, but the short percentage came down. And as the stock price is coming down, the short percentage is coming down below 5%. If the stock gets back up to over $20 a share, I'm sure the short percentage will come back up to 8 9%. The stock is up a ton, 75% in the past week, but it's down a ton the past 90 days and past year. Analysts appear bullish on this stock, projecting their earnings and revenue to beat the market and their industry. If you put $10,000 into this company when it IPO'd, you'd be about half of that right now at $5,100. The biggest shareholder is Brookside Equity at 11%. The founder of the company owns 7%, then BlackRock, Vanguard, and BNY Mellon. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have good price multiples since their stock price has come down so much. 17 PE, 2.4 price to sales, and 3.4 price to book. They have 121 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. They have a really high return on investor capital of 18%. They can cover their interest payments seven times. Their ROE is solid at 19%. They have lots of cash on their balance sheet from the IPO, so their current ratio and quick ratio is 4.5. They have 286 million of cash on their balance sheet, 200 million of receivables. So their receivables seem like they keep going up because of all the commissions they're booking. If the company deduces it may not receive a lot of these receivables, it could reduce the amount on its balance sheet and pass through a loss onto the income statement. They had negative 138 million of free cash flow in 2021, and they have positive 385 million of working capital. So it looks like they have enough funding to get through the next 12 months without taking on any debt or equity. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry, I've done videos of two other companies in the same industry as SLQT. And if SLQT has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're doing well in price multiples. Go Health has negative earnings, so we can't look at their PE. They have a high current ratio, high ROE. They're about average in debt. And Go Health and Select Quote are much smaller than Brown and Brown, which is a pretty big company. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 17% discount, but it's pretty obvious insurance, especially senior insurance, is a really needed part of our society. Especially plans like this that provide more benefits than Medicare. And there will always be brokers that are needed because a lot of people, especially seniors, are going to need assistance finding the right insurer. Now the problem is, which company do you put your money on? Is this the horse you're going to bet on? That's the hard part about investing. Even if you know something is going to be big in the future, you have to identify which company is going to fulfill that need. And if you bet on this company, I don't think it's a bad bet. I think they have their stuff together. They've been around a long time and they're growing a lot. I rank their free cash flow as 1 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and a ratio 7 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.